So, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the um, third workshop uh, uh, of, uh, the, of the series on professional development skills organized by the International Younger Chemists Network. And today, uh, um, as you know, the, the, the focus will be on science communication and we'll come shortly to this. So before that, let me just introduce myself. Uh, I am Joan Borges. I am a researcher at the University of Aveiro in Portugal, as well as the conference presence shared at the International Younger Chemist Network, so uh, IYCN. And today I will be sharing this session together with Claudia Bonfio. So Claudia, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia, and uh, I am a Mercury Fellow at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, UK and uh, I am a member of the team that uh, coordinated by Joao and I'm really happy to have you all here today. Thank you Claudia. So let's move on into the workshop uh, um, itself. So as you see uh, in this slide, so we have really a great lineup of speakers that we'll introduce shortly. Uh, before that let me just thank you all for joining this uh, workshop uh, as well as the, the, the panelists. So it's very important for us to, to count on them and on their insight and advice and the importance of science communication to target uh, different audiences, including the general public. So um, uh, this is the, the outline of the of this workshop. So um, we'll have the three talks. So uh, the first one will be from Dr. Joana Lovantunes, the second one from Dr. Marco Carlotti, and the third one from uh, Anna Aveninen. Um, so in this case, uh, um, We'll have uh, um, one of the talks uh, has been pre-recorded, and then we'll do one from Anna, since she's talking from Australia. So it's three in the morning, if I am not uh, wrong. So as you can imagine, it's difficult to, to be present live, but she was very kind in, in, uh, in recording, pre-recording the uh, uh, talk, and we'll be uh, uh, showing up the uh, recording uh, um, in here, in this workshop. And then at the end, we'll have a panel discussion in which we will um, uh, open the, the panel for any questions that you might have. And for that, please, you have an option that is the chat in which you can include all your questions to the speakers, but please send them just to organizers. So we'll collect them and then we'll make them to the, to the speakers in the panel. So there won't be any question after each talk, but just after, uh, but during the panel, but you can make your questions. Uh, so from now on, and uh, as, while, while the speakers are talking. So uh, before going into the uh, workshop, let me just briefly introduce the International Younger Chemists Network. So we are an associated organization of the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry since 2017. And you can see here the vision and mission of our network. Uh, so the vision to connect and empower younger chemists globally and the mission to support and advocate for younger chemists working across all the fields uh, dealing with the with the chemical uh, science, and uh, as some of you may be uh, might be uh, uh, um, unsure still today, so you can be a member of network, and for that you can just go to this website iycnglobal.com/membership, and it's completely free. The the membership, you can see in there the 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 uh, uh, requisites to be eligible to be a member. So. If you are doing your bachelor, um, uh, master, or PhD uh, studies across chemical science, you are eligible to be uh, a member. Uh, even if you already finished or you are doing your uh, postdoc training, you are still eligible. And if you are less than 35 years old, you can also be eligible to join the network. So please go just into this website. You can see all the details that I am mentioning, uh, other, other ones. And in any case, if you have any doubts, so we'll be very glad to, to support you. You can see here the, the email of, the, uh, of our organization, so uicn at iupac.org. And please also follow us through the LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So we post regularly about the events we're organizing as well as other stuff. And uh, we'll be glad if you could also reach us to us with some uh, feedback. So, uh, now let's move on into the, the, the first talk. The first talk will be given from uh, Dr. Joana Lobantunas. She is the head of communication at Instituto Superior Técnico. She's uh, located in Lisbon. She has really a very extensive uh, expertise in science communication. So this is just a short CV. So you can uh, Google and see a bit more of uh, all the activities in which she has been involved in, in the, her LinkedIn uh, account. 
but briefly, so uh, Joana uh, graduated in pharmaceutical science at the University of Lim Lisbon uh, and received a, a PhD in organic chemistry from the University of Santiago de Compostela. Then she moved into science communication, so she did a postdoc, and she has been involved in, in the, a plethora of uh, activities dealing with really uh, science communication. For instance, she was the, uh, uh, or she is the founder and was president of the Portuguese Science Communication Network, PICOM PT. Uh, from 2017 to, to uh, 2020. And currently, Joana, as I mentioned, is the head of communication at Instituto Superior Tecnico. She's also a lecturer in science communication uh, and social media for scientists. And she's the coordinator of the science radio show, 90 Seconds of Science. So this is uh, a show that uh, um, she's also one of the promoters that give a voice to Portuguese researchers uh, working in Portugal as well as abroad. And this uh, uh, um, goes live every day uh, from Monday to, to Friday. So without any further delay, I would like to hand over to uh, uh, Joanna. I will allow you to share your screen, please. Um, okay, hi, hi. I think you can see me now. Um, I will try to show my screen. I'm not sure if you can Perfectly. see me. Okay, um, but if I do this, you will also see the next slide or are you seeing my presentation? We see the um, next slide. Okay, wow. Well, that's that's one, one bad thing about doing this stuff um, online is that I, I can't have any secrets. I can't hide any secrets from you. Well, first, I'd like to thank for this uh, invitation to to be on the um, on on this on this panel. It's really it's really nice. I'm just looking at my phone to check on the time. So, thank you for the nice presentation. Thank you, João. Thank you, Claudia, for hosting me. And hi to Marco and Claudia and everyone following us. Uh, I will just do a brief uh, exposure. I, 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 I was, uh, I have a degree in pharmacy and I did research in chemistry. So I, I'm, I'm setting my talk a little bit on how to, to, to do science communication, particularly in chemistry. I'm working from home, as I think most of you, and I, right now the cat is attacking my, my Christmas tree, but I'll try to focus on the presentation and talking to you. So I will I will talk about some things about um, doing science communication, particularly if focusing on chemistry, because I, I imagine most of you are chemists, and also talk a bit a little bit on how I came from being this. This is me presenting my PhD thesis in Santiago Compostela, as Joan talked about, and this is also me doing a TEDx uh, last year here in Lisbon. So I hope you can notice some differences, not only that I was pregnant and then the second one I'm not pregnant anymore. But th there are a few more differences that I'd like to highlight and that might be, be interesting um, also for you. So why are we talking about or why should we be talking about science communication? There is this quote, I keep repeating myself, but it's so perfect that I, that I just can't stop quoting it, that it's okay. Science is not finished until it's communicated while you, you you are doing your work in science and for me science goes up to the peer review process until your paper is accepted and reviewed by your peers and or to be published and to be considered science and that's when science uh, the, the the scientific process uh, ends theoretically but what we advocate and mark walpart said this uh, this very interesting uh, way of putting it is that until you have communicated your work to the outside world, your work actually is not finished. It's not finished when you publish the paper or when you present your work to your peers. You have to put science out there. And why do we say that? Well, there are many reasons why we say that and why should scientists get involved and why should universities get involved in doing this? On one part, there is a return on investment thing. You know, we most of our science is done with public money, paid by the taxpayers' money. So they need, they they have the right to have their value, to have the return on the investment they put in us. But also because if we show them what we did with the, with with what they gave us, 
we are, I'm sure they will, they, will, they will be happy that the money is spent in science. And also that's a way for us to lobby for more money in science and also to get more money from private funders. But also it's a way of, of increasing the notoriety and the reputation of our research institutes and then to get the best students and they get the best researchers and to, to promote scientific careers. But not also that, I'm also very interested in doing something that's beyond doing institutional marketing, that is promoting scientific culture, because having a scientific culture is the key to understanding the world. The only way to understand, and, and right now, the, 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 the world we are living in with a pandemic, we need to understand the scientific, I will not go into that, but we need to have some basis to understand what is going on in order to understand the importance of vaccination, that if we have a vaccine in less than one year, it's not magic, it's science, it's because it was invested in fundamental science for so long, so it's really, really important. So, but there, there's, there are some issues that prevent us from doing, from, from getting our science out there. And some of them are out, uh, outside our work or outside our responsibility. But some of them, we can all collectively and individually work to overcome them. One of the problems of putting science out there is that there is this, this I, I've done this chart, it's not the scale, of course, because, well, I've been thinking about this for, for a while now. So scientists do research. So you spend a lot of hours every day in the lab, usually weekends and nights, at least I did when I was working in organic chemistry, I worked a lot. And some of the research I do ends up being actual science being actually, uh, I, I get to present it in congresses and meetings and writing papers and so forth. So we do a lot of work and some of it gets out in the public and, and uh, gets out and gets published. And we have an estimate that less than 10% of the scientific papers that are published get it to, to the media through press releases mostly. And so it gets out to the public. So this means that only a small fraction a small fraction of the scientists' work gets out into the media. And that is a problem. It's a problem in many ways. One of the problems is that it creates a false image of what is science. If what goes out in the media is today scientists discovered something, it gives an idea that scientists are, are kind of weird creatures that are closed in labs and sometimes they get these ideas or these findings and they come out to the world and shouting it about it. But we know that's not science. That's not scientific process. And that's not how science is done. Also, when it gets to the media, that research is already old by, I don't know, almost a year because between you got the results and the results got you got to write the paper and the paper got to be published, uh, accepted and then, then published, there's a, a lag in time. So when I read scientists today discover that whatever, it's, well, it makes you kind of laugh when you know about it. So when you think about what is science, there are two, two quotes I usually, uh, I, I usually go to my go-to quotes to explain what science is. On, on the one side, there's this, the most exciting phrase to hear in science, the one that heralds new discovery is not Eureka, but hmm, that's funny. That's how I felt many times during my PhD. Whenever I got some results and I'm like, what is happening here? I have no idea, so I'll have to find out. Usually that's where something interesting is. And also there's this other myth that scientists are lonely creatures that work alone in their labs and they do weird stuff. But science is actually a collaborative work and it has to be collaborative work, not only in real time, you do collaborative work with other people from your lab or other labs or in other countries in the world, but also work from other people that came before you. So there is a sentence if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants, we construct over other people's works. So that's why sometimes we have to explain to people that whenever we discover or we find out something new, it's not completely out of the blue. You know, we are we are building knowledge from previous knowledge and that's how we build science and that's and that's how it's supposed to be. So um, 
how do we get it out there? So the one thing that it's important is that we find ways to talk to people about science, to talk about your work, then not only wait until the opportunity comes whenever a paper comes out. We have to, one of one of the things that I do as for my work is that I create opportunities so that scientists can talk about their work to other people in many different settings. And one of the problems with chemistry, well, there are many problems with chemistry. Chemistry is amazing. I love chemistry. Chemistry can be so beautiful. But there is one problem. One of the problems is that people that, that don't work in chemistry have a hard time understanding that. So it's it's that's why it becomes so popular whenever you talk about the chemistry of love or the chemistry of kissing or the all-time classic, the chemistry of sex, of course. This, these are very popular themes, but I'm betting most of you don't work on the chemistry of sex or kissing or love or whatever. Chemistry goes way beyond this. But if we also go look, I, there's this paper that I, I do, I do this, this um, radio show, so I'm interested in podcasts. So there's this paper that, that, that went on to study the, the podcast topics. And if you look at chemistry, it's it's not very well rated. It's under like 5% of the podcasts uh, in global production from 2004 to 2018, only under 5% of the podcasts on science podcasts were about chemistry. And also there is this master thesis of uh, Venon Vaj. We have this uh, master in science communication here in Portugal. And she did this, she's a journalist and she did the, the um, she went on to study what are the science themes that uh, readers are looking for. So it's important to know what, what what, what they, they value when they read. So she was working on Publico, that's, a, that's a, one of the most important daily newspapers in Portugal. So she asked to two groups of people, families and friends of people working in science and readers of a Publico uh, newspaper. And only 4.8% of the people actually were looking for chemistry in, their, in the news they were reading and 6.8% in the group of people that read Publico newspaper, people that are interesting in the science. So people are not actually very keen on listening about chemistry. So why is that? So maybe, maybe we don't have enough chemistry out there, or maybe we can do better at talking about our chemistry. And maybe we have to find new ways of talking about chemistry so we can become more engaging and having more people actually listening about chemistry. So there are three things I usually um, uh, go to whenever whenever I give the, my courses on how to talk about your science. There are three main things that I want to focus on for the, the next few minutes of my talk. One of them is you have to know your audience. What, what is the key idea that you want them to take home as the message? When they get home and they say, today I listened to a very, very cool presentation. It was about what do you want to, it to be? And also you have to know exactly who you are talking to because that's really, really important. One other thing is to mind your language. It's very important that you don't use words that people don't understand or also words that people might misunderstand because there are words that we can use in science that can mean diff completely different things from pe for people outside science and also there is this thing that sometimes this curse of knowledge concept that you know something so well that it goes without saying and then you don't say it, so you have to say it. The third thing is go about telling a story. It's about telling stories, and I, I won't go too much into this, but there's you really need to get them in and to try to find about your story. There are so many ways of doing storytelling, and we can talk about that in the questions. So very, very fast. Knowing your audience, you, you really have to when you you when you set up your your talk, you have to think about what can 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 be interesting to them, be it high school kids or lay audiences or the radio, it's about them. It's not about you. It's really all about them. 
uh, about your language, I, I wanted just to stop a, a couple of minutes on this uh, on this um, sculpture by this Italian uh, sculptor from the northern part of Italy, near Austria, called Ivan Lachneider. This I came across this sculpture. It's called Testa Pesante. It means heavy heads. And the first time I saw this sculpture, I thought, that's a scientist. All heads, all brains, and no bodies. You know, because scientists are so um inside their heads and so uh, they are so eager to let you know about all the concepts and all the things that they forget they actually have a body that talks whenever we talk it's not just our words it's also the way we move our body the way we look at people the way we move on stage the way we will we use our hands to talk and we actually have to use your body and you it, if you, if you, many times when you do the presentations, you have the screen light up, and then the person is in the dark. Like if the presenter, the, the presenter doesn't matter. Well, the presenter does matter. You are the one presenting your work. You matter. Make it count. Be there. Okay. And also the the minding your language. Whenever you, well, let me just give a couple of examples. Like for example, risk. In science, when you say risk of something, we, th we think about probability. For the, the lay person, risk, it's, it's uh, uh, a danger, for example. And many other cases like theory. For people, theory is just an hypothesis. It's something to be tested. And for us, a theory is something that's already proven like the theory of evolution. So you have to really think on the wording that you put out. And then, of course, there's the storytelling that you have to really tell a story and engage. These are the people from my first science communication course where we actually started to making them telling stories to everyone. So you can see, you can get grab your audience when you start telling stories and you, when you can transform your facts and sheets and bullet points into a story, then you can get your audience and you grab them. So I'll, I'd like to return before finishing, I'd like to return to these two pictures. So as you can see on the right, when I was uh, here presenting my PhD, you can see the pulpit, it was actually facing, looking at the screen and not at the audience. And I, of course, well, when you're presenting your PhD, you're allowed to be nervous and not look at anyone. But this is something scientists and professors do many times. They don't even look at the audience and they're completely in the dark. You don't think that's lightning, it's the board. And you can see on the other hand, on the other side, there's me looking at the audience, open arms and facing people. And my, my screen has just to be to be highlighting whatever I am presenting. So, so what, what, I, what I've done to get there is what I wanted to say with these two images also is that you can train. People are not born being great at talking about their work. It's something that you can learn. There are skills that you can master and there are ways to do that. One of the things that I did and one of the things that I started teaching to my to, 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 to people that come to my science communication courses are theater techniques. I have done theater, I have done stage and I've done improv and that really, really helps in controlling your body expressions in overcoming stage fights, in learning how to talk to audiences, and ultimately led me to be talking to my computer, imagining all the, the, the 50 people that are listening to me on the other side of the screen. So which is which is kind of weird. So I hope I hope I, I get I'm getting my message uh, across. So it's it's really, really hard. So uh, Okay, so I'll just I'll just uh, wrap up very quickly because I don't want to 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 spend too much time. So when you are working with science communicators, there are some things very quickly, some tips that you have to if you have a science communication unit at your research institute or at your faculty, you have to work with the communication office. So you have to let them know what you are up to. Let them tell them about your achievements give them or let them do good images of your work because it's not just about having nice wording you have to do it nice images it has to look good okay so and participate or tell them that you're participating in outreach events and be available um 
also be available to jump into events, be it a European Researchers Night, the Open Days, the exhibitions, receiving visits to the lab, because remember, it's all about practicing. You have to practice in order to become really good at doing it. Um, it's rehearsals in French, you say répétition. So you really have to repeat in order to become really good at doing your, your science presentations. And also, when you don't have science communicators, there are all, always some things that you can use. Going out on social media, I'll be happy to answer all your questions about social media. I'm very keen on using social media to put to put uh, science out there. Also, partner with someone and develop your own outreach concepts. Go to the FAME labs, go to science communication courses. There are so many things that you can do that can make you become excellent at talking about your work. So. Thank you so much for listening to me. And I would really like to know is, what's your story? Please let us know. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Juana, for this uh, great talk. So uh, I will now hand over and continue with the program. So uh, uh, again, so you can post all your questions in, in, the, in the chat. Uh, in this case to Joanna, but also to the other speakers while they are speaking. So don't hesitate and please send them to, to organizers only. We'll read them out during the panel. So now I will move on uh, to present the next speaker. The next speaker is Marco Carlotti. He's a, a scientific collaborator at um, uh, Instituto Italiano di Tecnologia in, in Italy. So Marco received his uh, bachelor and uh, um, MSc from the University of uh, Pisa, um, both in, in chemistry. And then uh, he turned to molecular electronics from uh, uh, to do his PhD from University of Groningen in the Netherlands. So Marco is currently uh, uh, a researcher. You can see that he's a Marie Curie uh, uh, fellow and has been involved a lot in the in research and the writing grants. He's also the co-coordinator of his FET Open project. It's uh, it's a very very nice. Uh, um, um, uh, project from that is uh, uh, financed by the European Union from Horizon 2020 that is now finishing. But during uh, uh, um, or outside the lab, he's also been involved a lot in science communication. So he has been uh, um, um, uh, chair of the uh, University of Groningen Theatre Society from 2017 to 2018, and he's, uh, he has been also involved in the Italian Science uh, uh, Promotion Group La Ciencia Quarta is responsible for uh, uh, chemistry content. So without further delay, Marco, I will hand uh, over to you. Hello, Joao. Thank you for uh, the nice presentation that you gave of me. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. Can you see the yes. presentation? Perfect, right? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, you already said a lot of things about me. I'm Marco and today I'm here to give you my tips to be a better entertainer when talking about uh, science while at the same time spending a lot of time doing your research. Cont uh, compared to the other panelists, I spend like 100% of my time in the lab. As you all said, I work at the Italian Institute of Technology. I'm a Marie Curie Fellow and a co coordinator of a 5D nanoprinting. In particular, in my research, in my research, I work on 3D, three-dimensional microfabrication, and you can see in this slide what is my most beautiful achievement, which is the 150 micrometers tall David of Michelangelo that we 3D printed, which is the smallest David's, Michel, oh, Michelangelo's David in the world. Well, uh, as uh, he said, when I'm outside of the lab, I do a lot of uh, stage thing, like I did a lot of acting, I'm still doing, I'm involved in um, improv comedy, and of course I also try to combine these two passions of mine into like using a stage to talk about uh, science. I did that both with uh, La Scienza Coatta, an Italian divulgation group, and like with few videos on the YouTube and being the moderators of uh, some um, debates. But let's, uh, let, let's come to what are we doing here today? Well, today, um, as a person that doesn't have a lot of time to do communication, I will give you like my tips to be better, improve your uh, communication skills when you're talking at conferences or if you want to do dissemination works or even like you want to start a podcast or whatever. 
like the basic principles of communications are the same depending on what you want to talk about now let's see like why are communication skills so uh, important um well mostly because um not everyone is there listening to you uh, you, when you talk, when you want to say, if you have something to say, first you need to find an audience where to say it, uh, to, to whom to say it. And you have to convince them that what you're saying is important, they should listen. Now, when, when we talk about this, quite often colleagues and younger scientists asking me, like, isn't science enough already? To them, science is enough when we are discussing science. So why shouldn't it be enough? Well, the answer is yes and no. Uh, for a couple of reasons mostly uh, the main reason is well that the scientific method actually is pretty recent in the, um, the human history less than 0.2 percent of our history was covered by the scientific method while as homo sapiens we are a social animal and we, we, we story tell everything when we talk so like storytelling has a lot of uh, methods that have improved during our history to better catch the attention of our brain so we should use them when trying to communicate the other reason why uh, science communication is so important is that science is a very competitive field especially if you're a young researcher and so being good at communicating actually gives you an edge on what are your uh, competitors so like it or not it does help however we all know that uh, not everyone likes communicating not everyone's like to be on stage not everyone likes to write a press release not everyone likes to go to participate in events and everything but however i want to like to reflect on this that it's quite important even if you don't want to have a career as a science communicator if you want to have a career in science because well it, first of all if you talk about your work you can discuss with colleagues and that would improve like, the quality of work it helps you during interview and uh, because you are more comfortable in uh, talking about what you're doing and it makes you known to people so that people have heard what you do and they know you exist besides it's required by many grants for example as a Marie Curie fellow when you write your uh, proposal you need to write down how you plan to disseminate your work which goes way beyond the simple I plan to write papers the so it's incredibly important, this thing, especially for young researchers. So I'll, I'll give you an example why. This is uh, Ben Ferencham. It's an amazing chemist that I had the wonderful honor to, to, to meet when I was in uh, the Netherlands during my PhD. And this is a, well, it's literally a screenshot from his Nobel lecture. And he won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for micro machines. Now, if I have to judge like this image from a, purely communication sense. I would say that it's quite bad. Uh, ben has got a bad posture on stage. And when he speaks, he has a strong Dutch accent, which doesn't encourage the listening. The slide, it's all blue, which is a weird choice of color. Um, because it's very cold. The picture is very bad, like taken with a phone. The, the font is like, come on, Ben, you can do better. However, he is Ben Fenneca. He can afford that because he's an amazing chemist. Like a person like Ben, can afford to have bad, bad lights, can afford to just talk about his science, because his science, when he tells this talk, is like it's a walk through through 40 years of chemistry, and it is interesting. However, as a young researcher, you don't have that luxury. So you need to find out how to communicate better. And communicating better, it's not simple. You need to study it, you need to train, you need to practice. The problem is that takes a lot of time that you might not have and it's totally understandable and even if you don't want to dedicate time to it, it it's your time it's your job it's your career it's all up to you so today we're gonna try like to squeeze in some of the best practices that you can have starting from general public speaking um, advices and then ending up to uh, how to make a presentation and how to deliver it better my first tip about general public speaking, and uh, it's also Johanna talks, talked about that, is uh, consider taking acting, improv, stand-up classes. I mean, they are, first of all, a lot of fun. They can be found in almost every major European city and um, also in English. And if you don't speak the local language, and I know this is important because 
as young researchers, we are asked to move around a lot. And this means that it's also a nice way to meet new friends outside of the working environment and expand your, your networking when you get to a new place. And yeah, definitely they will help you getting stage confidence and be cool in uh, performing in front of a lot of people. Considering performing a lot of people in front of a lot of people, also giving classes to students is a good idea. Not everyone likes it because we think that it takes time away from research. However, it really helps you to, to figure out how to talk about science in general. Because you have their students that if you, they don't understand, they will ask you to repeat it because they didn't understand. And ask for feedback. And you have to do it actively. It's not that you do a presentation, then you ask the people that were there, your friends, like, hey, how was it? You need to ask your colleagues, your PI, or people that you know at a conference beforehand, like, hey, I'm going to do a presentation. Can you come see me and tell me what you think about it? And you can do this with many, many things. I mean, uh, you can do it for group meeting conferences. Um, you can just write presentation and see what the other people think about it. And if you don't have the chance to do this, another alternative is to record yourself. And uh, then you can watch yourself and uh, see how you look, how you sound, how you did. That's a, recording yourself, it's an extremely efficient tool to improve in this because then you see what you don't see from your uh, first point, like first persona point of view. Another idea is to get inspiration from content you might like. like. TED Talks or YouTube videos, I'm not really a fan of TED Talks, but this is something that it's more useful once you know the, like, the basics of uh, communications, because then you can see how the speakers are playing with the different tools at their disposal to get your attention. If you want to get an idea of what I'm talking about, there is a well, I uh, said I hate TED Talk, and here I present you a TED Talk. It's a TED Talk by uh, Will Stephen, a TEDx talk, in which he speaks for 10 minutes about nothing. And you can really see what are the like, figure of speeches and the way to prepare your presentation in order to sound interesting, even if you have, in this case, nothing to say. Now, uh, I'm talking about form because I assume that being scientists, uh, you care, you already have the substance. I mean, you don't have to sell anything that is not there. It's your duty, your moral and ethic duty as a scientist to actually present real data and real work. So the form is just a way to talk about it better, to communicate it better, to, to make it more accessible to the people and your peers. And of course, the, the if you are talking to an audience and uh, you should be passionate because by being passionate it's you can get your audience by sympathy and you can get them on your side and they will be more willing to listen to you but we'll go back to this if you're a good actor you can try to fake it you can talk about i don't know um, empty jars and be the most passionate person about empty jars although you like you like them when they're filled with nutella but it, it can be hard if you're not trained to do that. So uh, talk about the things you like. Uh, even when doing a presentation at work, why do you want to talk about things you do not enjoy? Maybe there are things in your work you should enjoy and you can talk to your PI like, hey, I would like to present this instead of that. It's important, it's up to you. It's you that will go on stage. Now, um, all this general speaking thing, they will, they're useful for uh, everything. If you want to start a podcast, a YouTube channel, if you just want to go in the street, uh, jump on a box and talk to the people in the street about science. But what we encounter most of uh, young researchers are presentations. So um, how do we prepare your presentation? Joanna said this um, already, like the first rule, is uh, the first step is know your audience. So while she was talking, I prepared like a slide super fast, which is uh, know your audience uh, combined with should I put memes in my presentation? So that, that's a good uh, vibe to understand what your audience is. Like what memes would they get? Like on the left here, we have the chemistry cat. That's an evergreen. That's a, the kids love it. Your moms love it. You can put it anywhere. Yet, if you're doing a presentation in front of, I don't know, of your uh, chemistry student association of a university, the chemistry cat might be a little bit too cringy and you might want to have like a 
different mean spawn and that is more their age, which wouldn't work in the first time. However, there are some talks which would not require memes. For example, you're trying to sell your patent to an industrial party. Then the meme there might not be the best solution. Indeed, know your audience. Now, uh, preparing a presentation is uh, my trivial, trivial to say, but it should be divided into three clear parts. The introduction, and uh, as I said, you're going to introduce what you're talking about, why it's important, and you should be state clearly what you're going to tell the audience about. The body is whatever you did, and the conclusions, which is more just than just as the last slide is, how do I make the story arch? How do I come to an end? How do I bring everything back that it makes clear to everyone that it's ended? Now, um, these two are the two most important parts of your uh, presentation. Um, we'll tell you why. So in the introduction, you need to win over your audience. So um, let's say I could have called like this, this webinar, um, your science sucks and you're not able to communicate it. Um, that would have not been a nice start because I mean, you don't even know me and I come to you and tell you like that your science sucks. I mean, what, what do I know? It? How do I act? So um, I should always start we usually always start your presentations in trying to be nice and positive about the things that you're going to talk about. It should be short and concise. You should not be sidetracking. It should be catchy. Like it, it should be like, why is your introduction different than the guy that spoke before you? And this is very important and not always done. It should leave the audience with a clear view what happened. Did you still see the presentation? Yeah, okay. My computer went weird. Um, so you, you should leave the audience with a clear view of what you're talking about. So that they, they know what to expect and you can fulfill those expectations. I will give an example of a very, very bad introduction. Here is an introduction from Abraham J. Simpson, which is telling about like something which I don't know. But so there was this one time I got a ferry to go to Shelbyville. I needed a new hill for my shoe. So I decided to, to go to Morganville, which is what they call Shelbyville in those days. So I tied it on into my belt, which was a style at that time. Now take the ferry to Costa Nickel. And in those days, Nickel had a picture of bumblebees and so on and so on. Um, like he's telling me a lot of details. He's getting a lot sidetracked. And I have no idea what he's going to talk to, be, to, to me about in the future. Like I have no idea what this story it's going to be about. Therefore, once we stop the introduction and we'll get into the body of the discussion, I will do not I will not know where I should stand. Also, don't use comic sense in your presentation if you can. The body, it should be the easiest part for a science because I mean that you don't need to invent anything. That's literally what you did. My only advice is to be coherent and like use the details, enough details your audience understand but it doesn't bore them if you wanted to have like a quote for it that you can quote me for is like you're telling a story you're not telling the story of you doing research so uh, if you did a series of experiments that took you six months but they didn't end up in a result that is worth talking about don't mention it in your presentation because that would be just confusing for the audience i mean i'm following you thinking that you are walking toward your result and yet you don't give you don't deliver so just skip it to the, the to, to tell it nicely. And conclusions are very important. Um, for a thing, like if, let's say they should never come in abruptly. So the end. Thank you very much. I mean, if I will stop my talk here, it would be extremely weird for you, and you would be left with like, what the hell is going on? I did not expect it, so I left things open. So um the conclusion should arise naturally from what you're telling. If I said at the beginning of my talk, but we see the Michelangelo's David, and like I made the Michelangelo's David, they're gonna tell you how you can make it. I will start telling you how it's possible to get there, and my talk will finish with me actually making it, because that's what is important. And should be should highlight um, the, the the last slides should highlight your work, the story you told until now. And 
it's important because the two things that people remember most from presentation or from any intervention, it's the introduction and the conclusions. And that's always true. So uh, you need to be extremely careful on how to open and how you will close. Of course, after preparing the presentation, you will need to deliver it to your audience. There is a step in the middle, and um, if you, it helps me a lot, but um, it helps to write your speech multiple times. I know it takes time, so you need to find a way, but it improves the quality of your speech a lot, and not only of your speech, because also it works with grants, it works with papers, it works with many things. When delivering your talk, there is only one rule that you need to follow. You need to keep your audience interested. Um, this, uh, there is not one way of doing, there is many ways of doing it, it's because you need to be more entertaining than everything else that is going on at that time. If you are in a conference hall, you need to be more interested in the conference program, their smartphone, their working emails. If you are presenting in a theater, you need to be more entertaining than whatever the person next to, sitting next to them is doing. If you are presenting in the street, you need to be more entertaining than everything else is happening in the world at that moment. There are um, many different um, things that you can um, care of, and I won't, unfortunately, won't cover, won't, won't have time to cover like them all in depth. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few of them, in particular, like uh, being fluent in the language you are delivering your presentation um, helps. Also, be aware of the lexicon. Like, uh, don't say cool, don't say nice. Try to work in more surprising, remarkably. It's amazing to, to give more depth into the word you're using. And um, the, of these things, I'm going to focus just on this ones. One is the thing that I have close to my heart is avoid the ums. So that's something that we tend to do a lot when uh, we are presenting. So when we are put in front of an audience and our brain switches to the mode, now I need to talk. And in doing this, our brains try to avoid silences as much as possible. So every time I'm stopping to recalibrate what I want to say or uh, I need to show something, our brain lets us go like, um, it's try to put attention to it. Every time someone is speaking, it's very often um, they, they start speaking like this. Um, so basically, when they try, don't have anything to say, they um, they fill the void with a. Um, and um, um, trust me, um, if you avoid the um, um, your um, presentation will improve the quality a lot. Another two things. Well, this is tied to enjoy the pauses. So when you're talking, instead of just talking, you can take some moments to actually not say anything. Uh, this will give you time to you to think about what you're going to say next. And it gives time also to the audience to actually reflect on what you just said, which they might need it, especially if you are talking about science and you just said a very complex thing. Another important thing is to break the rhythm. And you can do this in many ways. You can break the rhythm by um, changing the tone of your voice. Uh, what I did just now, like uh, changing the tone of your voice. That's, that change actually gets the attention back. Or how about putting in a question every once in a while? That's also break the rhythm and refocus the attention. Or if you remember earlier, the slide about the recording, the slide about the recording yourself, it was black while all the other slides were white, that also recreates the attention. And um, of course, we also need to talk about uh, the, the slide design, which is very important. I'm sure why it's very important. It's what do you think about this slide here? It's terrible Hi, slide. Yeah. Mark, can you, uh, just one minute, okay? We have to. Yeah, yeah I'm one. done. Okay, thank you. So this is a terrible slide because it's like uh, it's the slide. The, the title is moved. The, the background is blue with a magenta over it. And if you don't believe in slide design, well, think about it this way. Uh, like. I mean, a movie, you need good photography. You need to be well shot so that you pay attention to the story. You don't notice how it's well shot, but you notice if a movie is bad shot because then it won't let you focus on the movie. So basically, that was an um, example of slide design and also an effect on rhythm break with the slides. And if you let them sink in for a second, 
that's also the effect of a pause. And well, I did all together because I was running out of time, as you all reminded me. So I want to leave you with my last most important advice when it comes to deliver your talk, which is when you're preparing and deliver your talk, remember that you are your first audience member. So um, you might ask for field feedback, you might take inspiration for other talks in the internet, but if, if it feels forced for you when you say it, you won't deliver it well. If what you're talking about doesn't, you're not having fun saying it, your listeners will not have fun saying it. So uh, always check with yourself because if you're not confident in talking about something, then uh, you might as well skip it. And I think that was a good crescendo for ending my presentation. I said earlier about, um, about the conclusions. Well, thank you for listening and uh, prefer the questions as you, I would say, just, yeah, contact me or uh, we can talk about them later. Thank you very much, Marco. So uh, let's uh, keep on with the schedule. So this talk was very complementary to what Joanna is mentioning in their, in their talk. And now for the final talk before the panel, so we'll uh, hear from uh, uh, Anna Aveninen. She's the uh, communications officer at Australia Academy of Sciences. So uh, she earned a, a bachelor in chemistry from Monash University in Australia. She, and then she turned into a professional science uh, communicator and social media manager uh, since 2015. Um, she has been uh, 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 writing uh, uh, competition stories from the periodic table of uh, 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 to celebrate International Year of Periodic Table. She she's also very involved within the International Younger Chemistry Network. Was one of delegates, and now she's a communications officer at the Australian Academy of Sciences. She, uh, she writes science articles for the Academy Curious Project. You can check in the in the online and helps maintain the Academy's social media presence. And today, so Anna will uh, talk about uh, mainly about social media that will be also complemented to what the other panelists mentioned. So I will now share her presentation. Hello, when you're watching this, I am fast asleep because it's in the middle of the night in Australia and that's why I unfortunately couldn't join in on the panel discussion today. If any questions do come up, you can reach me via Twitter, LinkedIn or email in the order of preference. Those details are on pretty much every slide, so please do get in touch. Uh, today I'll give you an overview of my science communication career and some tips for how to get started and things that I kind of wish I'd known when I was just starting out on my journey. First, I'll give you a snapshot of science communication in Australia. I'll talk about my current employer, the Australian Academy of Science. I'll tell you how I ended up here in the first place. And then I'll talk more technically about uh, where to begin communicating your science, some tips for online science writing, how to use social media for science or science communication. And finally, I'll talk about what I'd do differently if I was just starting out today and what I'll be doing in the future to, be to develop my own skills. In Australia, science communicators are divided into two camps. The one is uh, research scientists who kind of do science communication on the side, which I think is probably a majority of the audience today. But the other camp are people like me who do science communication as our day job or as gig based work or part time or however people make it work. There are really more activities in Australia that I could list in one presentation. So here are just a couple that I thought would be interesting to share. The first is Australian Science Communicators. Um, this is the professional organization for science communicators in Australia. They run a science communication conference every year. Um, they have job listings, bulletins, networking events, the sort of things that you expect from a professional organization. The next is the Australian Science Media Centre, uh, which acts as a hub to connect journalists and scientists. 
they have an expert database for journalists to look for experts to comment on specific stories. And they also have a news feed where research organizations can submit um, media releases for journalists to find science stories in Australia or relevant to an Australian audience. If you're a fan of outreach events, uh, National Science Week is going to be your favourite. Um, this happens in mid-August every year and it's just this week-long extravaganza where there's one of pretty much everything somewhere in Australia during that week. Finally, the Australian Museum Eureka Prizes are probably the most publicised science prizes in Australia. They usually get a lot of press. Um, and are pretty mainstream. It's this whole big gala event and everything. There's also a prize for science journalism, or I think two prizes for science journalism. Not for science communication yet, but we can dream. Finally, if you're interested in this kind of global view of science communication and how that varies around the world, um, this book was just published earlier this year, um, Communicating Science, a Global Perspective from the Australian National University Press. And it's got a whole bunch of countries and uh, an overview of sort of the state of science communication and the history of science communication in those countries. There's a free PDF available at the moment, so go snag that if that's something you're interested in. Next, I'll talk about my employer, the Australian Academy of Science. The Academy is modelled on the Royal Society of London, so we're the sort of Australian counterpart to that. Um, we are an independent not-for-profit organisation with an elected fellowship of Australia's top scientists. One of our key missions is to champion, celebrate and support excellence in Australian science. We foster connections with international science. Um, for example, we are the national adhering organisation of IUPAC. We have a policy team that provides independent expert advice for evidence-based policy development in Australian politics. Um, and finally, we uh, promote a public understanding of science. One of the ways that we do that is through the Academy's Curious Project. Um, in this, we produce videos and articles talking about science in a way that's accessible to your average Australian. Um, we cover breaking news, uh, but also science explainers about topics like vaccines, bushfires and climate change, but also covering questions like which came first, the chicken or the egg, or why do flightless birds have wings? Our focus is really on telling stories about science. Now, the main way that we share this content is through our website, science.org.au slash curious, but also we have a big focus on social media. The Academy is on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, YouTube, and Weibo. And that's kind of been my focus, especially later this year. Um, I produce some articles for Curious, but also I make sure that our content is seen via social media. So how did I end up here? How did I end up working at the Australian Academy of Science? Now, I know this is going to make the job seekers among you a little bit upset, but unfortunately, the answer to that question is serendipity. In 2015, I was working on a chemistry PhD and I got an email from the Royal Australian Chemical Institute seeking contributors for a book they were writing for their centenary year in 2017. And I sent them a link to my blog and my Twitter and I said, um, do you want a PhD student to help? And they said, actually, um, we need someone to manage our social media accounts. Would you like a job? So then I kind of grew the position from there and eventually decided that I didn't need that PhD after all. So I left and focused on science communication full time. And uh, in 2020, I started a job at the Academy. So with any job, you really have to be in the right place at the right time. Um, but I think there are a few key lessons from that story that will help you land a job in science communication or any job whatsoever. The first lesson is um, join your professional organisation. I was a member of the Royal Australian Chemical Institute, which is why I got that email in the first place. And the second one is when you get an opportunity to do something you want to be doing as your career, take it. And it really helps to be a bit comfortable doing things that you don't feel like you're perfect at just yet. 
All right, so let's say you want to start communicating your science. Next, I'll cover kind of the key questions you should be asking and where to begin. Before you begin any communications project, the most important question to ask is who is your audience? Who are you writing for? Who most needs to know about your work? The more precise you can be about an answering this question, the better your chances for success. Let's say you're studying the effects of caffeine on pregnancy, for instance. Um, then you'd be targeting pregnant people, their partners, or people thinking of becoming pregnant. Most of the time, figuring out your audience is more challenging than this, but it is very important that you ask yourself that question and really interrogate that. After you've figured that out, the next question is, where is your audience? You want to figure out what they're already looking at, where they're looking at content, so you can serve your science communication content where they already are. That's how you maximize your chances of finding the people that you need to find. Once you've figured out the answers to those questions, the next step is tell your story. People love stories. This is how we naturally process information. If you can, you should try and structure your piece of science communication like you would structure a story with a beginning, a middle and an end and using all of those conflicts and struggles that you've been through. Think about how you tell someone about that time that you dropped a really expensive piece of glassware and you were really nervous about telling your supervisor, but actually they were quite understanding and it all turned out fine in the end. Figuring out how to do that can sound a little bit overwhelming and a little bit scary, but it gets a lot easier once you figure out your hook. So this is uh, the most interesting, exciting, significant part of your work condensed into as few words as possible. This is what people talk about when they talk about an elevator pitch. And this is what you tell your friends and family when they ask you what you do and they're not scientists. So you've figured out your story. Next, I'm going to talk about five tips for online science writing, how to transform your academic writing into online popular science writing. So this could be articles or blogs or even social media. All of these tips will apply to all of those areas. Tip number one, avoid acronyms and jargon. Acronyms, pretty easy, just take them out. Jargon can be a bit more difficult. So this is, instead of using technical scientific terms, you describe what you mean in plain language. This can be difficult because it can feel like you're sacrificing accuracy by selecting terms that are more easily understood, but not necessarily the best for describing the specific situation that you're talking about. Figuring out how much detail to leave in is a daily struggle for me still. Tip number two is avoid vague language. So if you read a sentence and you think you would say it differently if you were just talking to a friend about it, rewrite it. So instead of saying our work contributes to mitigating climate change, say we are trying to stop climate change. This can also be a bit difficult to do because in science we're trained to avoid these sort of definitive statements. And I think you can always add in context, you can always present your evidence, but any claim that you're communicating, you should be willing to stand by. Tip number three, use short sentences. I've had a difficult time with this. I've always written in these long flowing run on sentences and it's been such an uphill battle for me to stop. I used to think I don't write for kids. I write for highly literate adults. Why do I have to simplify how I write? But then I think about how I use social media or how I read news or articles online in my spare time. I just scroll and I skim stuff. I absolutely don't read every word. When you're writing for online, you have such a limited amount of time to capture your audience's attention. You have to make the best use out of that few seconds people are looking at your social media post or reading the first paragraph of your article before they click away. I went to an online writing short course last year and the absolute best takeaway was front load everything. Put the most interesting, exciting stuff right at the top of your article or even at the start of your sentence. Tip number four is use active language. This is just more easily digestible 
and uh, makes your work more accessible to the reader. So instead of saying a new material was prepared, say I made a new material. I only ever really use passive voice anymore if I can use it to front load a sentence in a social media post, if I can use it to put the most exciting words in that sentence at the front. Tip number five is use expressive nouns and verbs. So this is, I think, directly out of the journalism playbook. I think they're generally taught to avoid using adjectives or adverbs and instead of and instead selecting their nouns and verbs in a way that conveys the same meaning. So this is how you create those short sentences which still evoke emotion. So instead of saying the intense fire burned hotly, say the inferno blazed. You're conveying the same sort of emotion, but in fewer words, that is more digestible. Next, I'm going to talk about social media for science and science communication. So this is my area. This is what I do most of in my day job currently. I use social media to communicate science. I could talk about this topic for literal hours, but unfortunately today I won't have the time to go into lots of specifics. Instead, I'm going to talk about why you might want to use social media and um, some of the platforms that you can use to do that. If there are any specific platforms that catch your eye during this presentation, um, there are lots and lots of resources online that you can look up that will teach you how to best use that platform and how to get the most out of it. Actually, there are just even lots of resources for social media management in general. Um, and if you need any pointers, I'm more than happy to help. So social media at least used to get a pretty bad reputation in science circles. Um, people think that it's kind of inane and superficial and fake. And look, I won't lie, there are parts of social media that will always be like that. But I think the most exciting bit about social media is how accessible it is. There are millions of people around the world who use the big platforms every single day. This is a way for you to deliver your message directly to your audience. You don't have to go through a media company or your university com communications or anything. You can talk directly to your audience. And I think that's really, really, really powerful, especially when it comes to communicating science. So here are a couple of ways that you can use social media for science communication. You can share your results and you can find opportunities. So they not only help you communicate your science to the public, they also help you advance your career. In terms of science communication, the big ways that I think social media can benefit science communication are that they humanize science. So in the media, you can occasionally get the sense that science is just this, you know, big conglomerate, faceless organization, um, which is where all the conspiracy theories come from. But I mean, we know better. We know that there are real people behind science and we're all, all individuals with our own feelings and our own views on things. And social media can really help communicate that. The second way is you can share your personal journey, yes, but you can also share science as a process. So I think sometimes in science communication, we still fail in communicating how we arrive at the results that we communicate. And social media can really be a way to highlight that. So here are some platforms that you can use to engage with the science community to advance your career. LinkedIn and Twitter are particularly good for finding other scientists and sharing your research with them. On Twitter particularly, the real-time chem and chem Twitter communities are really, really great networking opportunities if you are not aware of those yet. The Black in Chem is a new, pretty new community, which I don't know that much about. Um, it's obviously not my space, um, but it would could be appropriate for some of you. In terms of sharing your science with a non-scientist audience, I think you can make any social media platform work, provided you can deliver the type of content that is appropriate to that platform and that you can find your niche audience on that platform. So here are just a couple of options. 
Facebook is falling out of favour in some circles, but it's still the biggest social media platform that there is. It has a huge user base and they can actually be a lot younger than you would think. Facebook also works because you can deliver almost any content type on it. Um, they're shifting to video pretty heavily, but image posts, text posts and links still work reasonably well on that platform. If your science is visually interesting, um, Instagram and Snapchat can be good to look at. Um, Instagram also allows some short videos on it, uh, but images still do the best on that platform. Snapchat is where Instagram stories were born, so if you're interested in that sort of short form content, that's a good one to look at. Uh, the other ones, of course, TikTok. I don't personally use it, but I know there are some science communicators who are doing really, really great work on that short form platform. Uh, if you're interested in producing longer video content, uh, YouTube is the one that you want to look at. There's also platforms that are more niche with smaller user bases like Reddit or Pinterest that might be easier for you to break into because there's not such a huge science communication base on them yet. Um, it's really good for any science communicator using social media to stay agile and keep developing your communication strategies because social media changes all the time. And if you can change quickly with the times, you will have greater success. Finally, I'm going to talk about what I would do differently if I was just starting out in science communication today and what I'll be doing more of going forward to develop my own skills and my career. The number one tip that I would give to people starting out today is to recognize that Communication is a social science. There is published research on best practices for how to communicate key messages to different audiences. So I've personally had a bad habit of focusing on the science part of science communication. And I think we need to recognize that people communicate nuanced messages around the world all the time, and we can really learn lots from them. One good place to start is uh, the Journal of Science Communication, which is a peer-reviewed open access journal that you can access online right now. Finally, I really encourage you to develop your communication skills with a short course. Um, there are short courses on pretty much everything online. There's online writing, social media management, podcasting, graphic design, all the sorts of things that you might want to use to communicate your science. So some options are Coursera or Skillshare. Um, I mentioned that I did an online writing short course last year and I had this moment of why didn't I do this sooner? This would have been so useful to me like three years ago. So don't make the mistakes that I have made. And that's me done. That's my very speedy overview of my science communication journey and some hot tips for you for online writing and social media for science communication. Again, if you have any questions, I'm available via Twitter, LinkedIn or email in that order of preference. And I would love to hear from you. Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your talks. So thank you, Anna, although uh, Anna uh, is not here with us due to the time difference. As I mentioned, she is working in uh, uh, living in Australia. Um, so now we'll have uh, some time left for the, the panel. Uh, and for that, uh, I would like to call to the stage uh, um, uh, Joanna and uh, uh, Marco. So unfortunately, uh, uh, Anna is not with us, but I think gave you a nice overview of the, the importance of social media in, in communicating science, mainly in the nowadays with this pandemic, we are we pass most of the time at home still. So it's really, really key. So Claudia, I am now handing over to you to moderate the session, please. Yeah. So thank you very much, Joao, and thanks to all the speakers for their amazing presentations. So uh, in the sake of saving times as much as possible. Unfortunately, we only have uh, less than 15 minutes for the panel discussion. Uh, I first want to say to everyone that uh, all the questions that we will not be, be answering today will be sent to all the speakers so that they have the opportunity to answer to all of you. And then we will find a way to share all the answers with all of you. Uh, and uh, uh, I'd like to ask all the speakers to be very brief in their answers to my questions. 
So I'll start from the uh, with the first question um, that uh, is directed to both of you, I guess. Uh, and it's inspired from a question that we got from uh, Ricardo from Portugal. And uh, um, I guess it's directed to both of you from two different points of view. So if you are a scientist and you want to communicate with a science communicator or someone that works uh, that can help you in writing a press release for your paper or for your science and whatever. Uh, how do you interact with each other? What's the most common problem that you face as a scientist talking with the science communicator or as a science communicator talking with a scientist? And uh, what can you do better in that? Uh, we can start with Joanna. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's a very interesting question and it's very important because you have to start somewhere. Well, there are different science communicators that have different styles. I prefer for it, it depends on what's uh, I'm sorry, you must be here. My dog. I'm very sorry for that. Uh, if there is a paper coming out, I prefer start with reading the paper. I prefer they have the paper sent to me and I read the paper, even if it's a very weird, difficult science for me, I prefer to start there and have a set of questions and I talk to the scientist and then I can decide what to do with the material. Sometimes I understand there's a story there to be told and that could draw some media attention. I can have the, the press officer um, activated or I can understand I can only do something at, uh, at the website of the institute or with social media or something. So I, I really need to understand what it's all about so I know what's the story there to be told. So, so I'll just start before... with reading the paper or reading the project or whatever it is, and then talking with the, the PI, the, the principal investigator of the project. Yeah, I see. So just before giving the word to Marco, just to clarify on what you said, what happens if you send all of your, you read the paper, you send the questions mm -hmm. to the scientists and you get some answers that are impossible to be understood by co the common audience. So do you just tell the scientists I have no idea what you just told me or how do you do I do that, that in a very diplomatic way. <laughs> I usually say, well, this is not my area of expertise. So I, 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 use, use, I use that card or, uh, or I say, well, I, I know a little bit about this, but I'm really not getting it. Please explain it to me because I'm not from your area of expertise. And what happens is, um, well, well, when you're a science communicator, I, I, I don't, you don't get this right the first time. It takes a while because in the beginning, I, I remember when I started doing science communication, it was really important that I had a PhD when I talked to scientists because they were like, oh, there's this science communication officer. She knows nothing about science. And I said, no, 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 I, I used to be a scientist. And they're like, okay, okay. And then, but then I, I said all the, the, the same questions, like, I don't understand. You have to explain it to me. What does the crystallization mean? What's that protein? What the, what's folding? What's whatever, you know? So I made them explain it to me until I understand. I cannot write or explain something to a reporter if I don't really understand what's going on. So now I've moved to an engineering faculty. So I'm, I'm starting all over again. I'm talking with physicists and with the with the electronics people and informatics and i don't understand anything they do so i'm like i don't understand make me understand so i can make the world understand thank you very much marco what do you do if you have to talk with the press release office of your university about a paper you're about to publish marco you are muted Still muted. Maybe your microphone is not working. Can you try removing it? I still cannot hear you. <laughs> it was working before though. So your presentation was fine. <laughs> Do you want to try leaving and rejoining us? And I will ask you this question. Okay, no, now I got it. I oh. think uh, I don't know how did it. Oh, okay. Um, so, was it like how to interact from the researcher point of view with the uh, communication officer? Well, um, language is the main problem, as Joanna said, because sometimes you, um, as a researcher, you try to use certain words that for you are necessary, while the officer on the other side does not uh, like perceive it the same way. 
the idea is that I don't think there is an optimal common ground. You both both the parts need to like give a little because sometimes you you write your own press release, then it comes back the revised version from the communication officer, and what you're left with is like, well, I will. You changed my words, but now they don't mean anymore what they meant at the beginning. So indeed, there must be um, a sort of giving and take from both sides. And if the, you can, you should try to your best as a researcher to make it more clear as possible what you're doing. And the officer should try his best to understand and try to put it in words that makes everyone happy. That rarely happens, but that's the that's language problem that uh, it's not easy to solve. Thanks, thanks. Uh, very good points, actually, the ones you made. So um, we have another question from Tiago, uh, still from Portugal. Um, and uh, I think it can be joined together with another question we have uh, from Vania. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing all of your names, by the way. Um, that is related to social media and presence of social media and discussion and communication of science on social media. So what are the most effective Ways we have ways we have and tools we have to communicate science to the general audience to the general public, but also it's let's say easy to say you just post something on social media, Twitter, Facebook, or anything. How do you get the credibility you need so that whatever you post is considered is trusted or is considered in a good way? Also in terms of you know fake news and everything. How do you get the credibility you need, and how do you com communicate in the best in the best way possible? Well, we you have to build a reputation. You have to build a reputation, and that is built over time. You know, sometimes you can. Um, th there are many social media available, um, ranging from uh, professional social media like uh, LinkedIn or Academia Do or ResearchGate, but ResearchGate and Academia Do are more for um, the between scientists. LinkedIn is more like you're showing off your CV and your connections to the world, but you can also use LinkedIn to post uh, scientific content online. And then there are the general social media like Twitter, Facebook and Instagram and now TikTok, but I will just uh, start stop at Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We have enough of that. Twitter is very interesting because it's where uh, all European Union, all the, 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 the financial supporters are on Twitter and many of the politicians are on Twitter as well. And much of the scientific community is on Twitter. So I think it's really interesting to follow the scientific community on Twitter and to be there to actually build and, and post your stuff online. But I would say that on, maybe on Twitter, you'll be talking mostly with science interested people like like minded people or people already very much interested in science. When you go to Facebook and on Instagram, that's a whole different ball game. You're really talking to a, a very general audience on Instagram. You have like 18 to 25 and on Facebook, you have the 25 to 35 mostly. Well, there are. I'm, I'm talking generalities, okay? So, and then you have to find your voice, the way you talk about your research, the way you talk about science in general or other people's research. It's the way you talk about that that will make you build your reputation. You can also say that you're a scientist working on, on this field and that gives you some, some anchor. Of course, you're not talking for your institution, you're talking about yourself, but people understand that you're a real scientist in a real job. They actually pay you to do science. So you should be a accountable person for that and then you have to find your voice you know you cannot you don't have to be too formal you can have a, a, a lighter or more informal voice but you have to find the way you like for people to the way you want to talk about and don't forget <laughs> to use images and links and videos because if you just write what well, you should a uh, blog instead of using social media if you're if you're into hardcore wording of stuff Marco, I, before you, instead of answering to the same question, I was actually wondering whether I can twist the question a bit and ask you if in 30 seconds you can tell me um, whether you prefer, as a scientist, uh, a platform like Twitter that has only a specific number of characters and so you can convey your message in a much, small, in a much let's say, more concise way, uh, or if you prefer something like Facebook, um, that allows you to talk, to, to use more words to describe your work. 
which one which platform do you prefer okay in 30 seconds i would say that i prefer the facebook style however it's um when you try to communicate first step is know your audience so if i have to communicate about science i'd rather go on twitter although i don't like to be limited by the number of characters simply because like once you're there and you post it you know it's it reaches who you want you can tag who you want while on facebook it's more about the people that are there they are on your uh, your network it's the different yeah that's totally true uh so i have one last question for you uh and you can take a few seconds to think about this i want you um to to, to tell me what do you think is the main quality or the main skill because we've said that uh, uh, science communication and communication skills is something we can learn and takes a bit of time to uh, uh, to get them and to practice and to get to the best point we can what is the main quality or the main skill that you think one should have or should strive for to be considered or to become a good science communicator uh, well, that, that's one? very easy to answer to be a good listener you have to be a good listener you have to be because it's, it's it's all about that the only way that you can become better at being a communicator is that you can listen not only listen to the feedback that people give you which is actually quite important but also that you can read from the, the audience's reactions that you can actually you're not just there in a very one way of communicating you're actually looking at how people give you back or, or be it a live audience or be it on social media or be it anywhere you have to be able to listen and, ha and have feedback if you are a good listener you'll be a good storyteller thanks marco i think differently i come from hardcore theater and i say you should need a very good actor like if you're a good storyteller no matter what you say people will get interested in and that's what happens with all the influencers out there you can see that content is a second is left on, on the background also, it's not that it's up to you to deliver good content, but the tools that you use to deliver it, they are the same for everyone. So you are competing against people who spread fake news you are to, or no news and mm -hmm. we're trying to give your content and it's the same field. Thanks. These are actually both very good uh, advice that hopefully will be useful for our uh, listeners. And I just want to remind yeah. you, uh, let, all let of them just the, add, yeah. well this could I, I listen to what Marco said usually when I do my science courses my science communication courses I do that to the scientists and I always tell them the hardcore science they have to bring themselves that's why I only do communication courses with scientists that have their science um, uh, evaluated for their peers because they bring their hardcore science I teach them how to be better at communication and for that you need to be a good listener but of course you need a hardcore science i agree with that but that i expect the scientists to i'm not teaching hardcore science to scientists they have to have that for themselves thanks uh, my point was more of the, um, i can write a speech about science about whatever and i can have uh, my dear master student repeat it and one of us will be better at doing it and that will be the one that has got more experience into storytelling. I can rewrite his research and I can be more effective into delivering his research, although I don't understand it. Well, my master student I should understand his research, but the point is uh, simply because I know what's more effective in spreading the message. Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank you very much again for being with us, Joao. Sorry, I will just close, so show the, the very final slide. So we just have one minute. I think it was quite interesting. Uh, just to mention that we have the previous workshops uh, all on YouTube, the IUPAC YouTube, and this one will be also posting there. So we can go and check the ones that I am showing now in here. Uh, we also have another very interesting project uh, um, uh, that is a partnership between IUPAC and uh, IYCN that is called Chem Voice that aims to give a voice to early career researchers. We are organizing several workshops. You can also see them on IUPAC YouTube channel. These four already uh, were done. Um, and now just to finish, so I would like to thank again to all the speakers. So we have to run out. It was very, very interesting. 
and uh, we want to thank all the, the, the attendees for being present and uh, of course wish you very uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas and uh, Happy New Year and hopefully will be much better than this one. Take care and stay safe and thank you for joining.